Well, Brian, so we've moved over here to the uh, Slyker County part of the ranch. And uh, obviously we've got some different things going on. You've got, uh, you've got sheep over here. So one thing I'd ask you is what's different about uh, management when it comes to running your cattle versus your sheep? Man, I'd say the biggest difference for managing between sheep and cattle is, I mean, everybody knows you got that black cow in the pens. And when she's angry, she may want to smoke you. But a sheep can be super angry and it's funny. I run our replacement heifers over here with the sheep and we run them together in one group uh, until the cattle go back to the other ranch with the cows. But, um, you know, it's you just, you're measuring what I'm leaving behind is, is how I, I gauge it. And, uh, you know, we've, we've gotten away from any kind of a worm program with our rotation. And I believe that the cattle and the sheep cross terminate each other's uh, uh, parasites. So I think there's some benefit to running them together. Um, the bigger animals, I think, help uh, keep the predators circling um, and not stopping so much. But, um, you know, the, the biggest thing is, is trying to have grass, fresh grass in the pasture they're moving to. Hog damage. And that's just the, that's just the evolution. It'll have thistles or twin leaf Santa or buffalo burr, but it's, it's a low end succession. But the bare ground that the pigs create is um, really one of the hardest things to overcome. In fact, we, we probably were overstocked at one point when we, we didn't recognize the pig influence so when it was growing. Adding them into the uh, equation. For how much grass they take out. Yeah. So we're almost 200 yards to the corner, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm gonna pull my truck over here and get out with a bag of feed and walk to the gate. Uh, so technical assistance is one of those crucial cornerstones where, where it all starts, and that can take on a lot of different forms. Um, in fact, the example that I always run to in terms of describing how important technical assistance is, is so when, when Brian first started prescribed burning, he really didn't know what he was doing. He had went to a burn school and he'd went to the Kerr WMA um, where Bill Armstrong was implementing tons of fire, but he as a producer and as a landowner hadn't done it yet. And so he worked with technical assistance from NRCS um, there at Menard County, and they started burning. And that one experience turned my husband into a certified and insured prescribed burn manager. It turned him into a pyro, but he drank that Kool-Aid. And that one experience with technical assistance went with him wherever he went. And so it followed him from ranch to ranch in his future conversations with producers. And so that one experience, that one half day where you're out driving around with somebody who's in that capacity to offer um, an opportunity to think outside the box and say, hey, have you tried this or have you thought about this? It's, it's, it's really cool and it's really magical because that is where the art and the science really start to be combined in thinking of sustainability, efficiency, profitability, resiliency, I, you know, and it, it encourages a producer to try something different. And if they don't automatically just latch on to that technical assistance, they're gonna go to another producer and then ask that producer, hey, what about this? or have you tried that? And then you get peer-to-peer -peer learning and those peer-to-peer -peer networks are so important, all from this one little technical assistance conversation. So it takes on so many forms, but that is the catalyst for then all these other conversations and relationships and networks to start building and growing for them. So important. So Brian, we're standing here in uh, one of the uh, fires that you've had recently. Tell us a little bit about, uh, well, when you had your fire, uh, what you do to prepare for prescribed burning, and also kind of what are the goals that you have in mind when you're putting together uh, the prescribed fire and what you're trying to, to, 
to manipulate out on the landscape. Well, I, I think our goal every time, because whenever anybody takes fire with a mountain of pasture, you're carrying fire for everybody in the state. And so you could you can be a positive influence or have a real negative impact. So we want to have a safe fire every time. And, and a lot of that starts with fire breaks, you know, how we're going to keep the fire on the pasture. Uh, and then, you know, that we look at uh, brush near the edge on the perimeter and um, uh, any obstacles that we might have. Uh, this is our highway pasture. So we're on the north side of the highway. So we can only burn with a south wind here without being dangerous to the highway in this pasture. But uh, uh, we set our fire breaks. Um, generally, what we've been trying to do is, is have a fire when we leave a pasture. And, we, and so this pasture, the cattle and the sheep together have been in here since March. And uh, so whatever that is, 80 days so far, and uh, it'll be 180 before they come back or more. And, and so we'd have the fire, give it time to recover, grow the grass back and um, you know that's that's our rotation we rotate our livestock but the real rotation we focus on is our fire where we rotate the fire as well so so in your stocking rate you're also planning on the uh, the amount of fuel that you're going to need as part of that measurement yes for uh, preparing for your fire once you leave the once you leave the pasture yes yep yep and and so all that gets figured in there uh, the Part of the year we just have sheep here, and part of the year we have our calves from the other ranch and 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 the sheep. Uh, and of course, where you see the brush is still intact under the trees, that's where the fire walked around it. But where it knocked out the brush or even top killed a, a live oak, uh, that that's the effects of fire. Get more grass on the ground. dealing with and, and thinking about it in, the, in the industry right now is the, uh, the efficiencies and the productivity of our industry. And so with only 6% of the world's herd, we produce 18% of all the beef in the world. So how does that filter back into the, th the kind of efforts that you're putting into your your management and your efforts with your grazing lands and things. I like know that. we contribute to the food chain, and uh, we're very proud of the quality that we produce. Um, I think it's challenging where you get the really quality Texas beef mixed in with some imported, uh, but uh, you know from the things that are within my span and control, um, you know our rural communities are the, the backbone to our ag culture. Um, we, need, we need, you know, enough people in ag culture that the groceries get sent to our grocery store and that we have uh, good teachers at the schools and, uh, you know, the, the community. Um, and ag culture community is generally based in faith as well. And so, you know, this is all of the things that we want to preserve about the America that we grew up in. What's happening and what uh, what are y'all looking at as far as trying to prepare for potentials of that? Uh, I think I need to buy a younger horse before they go out of the roof because that the horse is the only way they got through it before that and the sterilized screwworm fly. And I hope that uh, they're breeding or creating a ton of those and they're ready to start dropping them out of airplanes. Um, the way they stopped it before, but you know, my granddad, every day of his life, he talked about screw worms and doctoring 
wormy sheep and cattle and uh, um, you know it made a lot of really good horses and made a lot of really good cowboys uh, and evidently the the salve is awful that they used to use that you couldn't get it off yourself or your clothes and uh, I think I can smell it just by the way he would would describe it but I think that it's gonna it's gonna be an economic uh, devastation for us um, is if if uh, a wire cut or uh, a scratch can get uh, the screw worm larvae started um, the the impact to our I mean the cattle industry the sheep the livestock so that that's gonna be uh, take a great big hit and it's going to have a real financial number that you can attach to it. But what this is going to do to our wildlife and how far it's going to set back, you know, white tailed deer and I mean, property prices are, are tied to our, our recreation value for the most part. And you know, that in the first three or four months, I mean, if, if, if they say screw worms are seven weeks out from getting us here and they're south of us and we have a south wind all the time, so they could get here quicker. Uh, I, you know, we're going to have velvet antlers on our deer. We're going to lose all of them. I mean, it just, they're, they're, they're not going to be any way, even they're talking about ivermectin feed and doing some things to, to help the body of the wildlife repel the worm. But I just don't see, I don't see how we survive that. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of rebuilding, you know, that uh, they talk about how that that's, They've been managing the white-tailed deer at this ranch since the 50s, since that time in the drought and, and dealing with screw worm. And uh, I believe it, it for such a devastating event that's coming towards us, it's hard to believe there's no news about it. We've been in this pasture since. April 3rd or something. So many different, I learned this from, you know, from so-and-so or, you know, this is from the coffee shop or learn this from a, an extension program five years ago. But what's so important is to meet that producer where they're at with science-based information that is at their level relative to their operation and their goals and their objectives of where they want to be. And so um, a lot of times that can be through an email, right, where producers just wants to see, hey, what do you got to say about this? Or a lot of times it's going to be in the back of a buggy or in a pickup driving around. But meeting that producer where they're at in terms of what they're ready to take on, what they're ready to understand in terms of drought, stocking rates, and all these different layers of complexity on our rangelands, it's just so important. But then also meeting that producer where they're at as a person. Right? There's, there's a face and a name and a family and a legacy behind every producer. And the second you get to know that, that element of them, it's a game changer because you now know that person as a producer and not necessarily as, as so-and-so who needs this type of, of help or this type of technical assistance. It's, it's names and faces and hearts and open gates and open minds and that only collides at technical assistance. part of the ranch and uh, when I took it over there was 14 locks on that front gate and and it used to drive me crazy but when I took it over I was like I'm gonna find out whose locks these are so I took them all off and put one lock in my phone number and they got to figure out who everybody was and I told them both the oil companies that it was time to fix this road in 1997 my dad did the road and uh, they I mean every time it was wet they drive a semi down you know, so, and I've never driven a semi on it, but I felt like they should fix the road and they both plugged their wells and left. I mean, it, they spent 50,000 each to plug their wells, but to put something back into the resource, that's just too much to ask. <laughs>